Hi, I'm James Schillinglaw, and welcome to Virtual Vacation Events, The New Luxury. And we're doing a series of talks with some of the greats in uh, touring, cruising, uh, hotels and resorts as part of this event. And one person we naturally had to choose from was Jeffrey Kent, who is the founder and CEO of Abercrombie & Kent. And most of you probably know Abercrombie & Kent. It's a longtime tour operator really specializing, began specializing in Africa, and now goes all over the world. And Jeffrey has seen it all and done it all, as, as we've interviewed him before. And the last time we did for Insider Travel Report, it was a wonderful interview we did. And we're going to find out all about luxury travel from his perspective. Good evening, and uh, lovely to be back with you. And, you know, you catch me in all the spots of the world. We could be in Uganda, or we could be in Kenya, we could be anywhere. Let, let's look back just to give you, and, and we've done this in the previous interview, but uh, uh, when, when did you found Abercrombie & Ken and what kind of company was it back then? Uh, remind our viewers a little bit about how you founded the company. Well, you know, my parents, my parents were the key motivators then. It's way back in 1962. And, uh, you know, we're from Kenya. I was in the British Army at that time in the Fifth Royal in a skilling room guards. And, you know, we lost all of our farms and self-government in 1962. And my parents were about to go to Australia or somewhere, and they're pretty visionary. And so we all sat down and we all said, you know, why did we start a safari company? And we all said, okay, that's fine. Let's do that. <laughs> and, and then we thought, so what's the name? And what was the problem with the companies? What's the name? That's okay. the hardest thing to do. And so we want to be, I really want to be top of the yellow page. And so we came up with Aardvark. They are not the anteater, but I mean, a horrible logo on the notepad. You know? so, <laughs> so we ended up making up with Abercrombie. Okay. Elegant Abercrombie and Kent. And so that was formed in 1962. And really, I realized then that everybody was hunting. Everybody came to Kenya to hunt. Right. And I didn't want to do that. And besides, Karen Downey being there 100 years, they were by far the biggest company owned by the richest man in town. I didn't want to compete with that. And so I said to everybody, why don't we do photographic safari? There was a, oh, nobody wants to come and take a photograph. They all want to hunt. I said, well, you, think you don't know that. They may want to. And so anyway, I, I developed the very first tented camp from my army experience. Right. And I launched that in 1967, 68, with ice, crew, with ice, with ice machines. So you could have ice cream, you have butter, you could have wow. fresh food. It was amazing. And I took all the military equipment to do it from my ex-army days. And, um, and, I, and I launched that in the United States with, with the slogan, shoot with a camera, not with a gun. And that oh. was my slogan. So that's, that was really it. Then my dad ran the office, and yeah. my mother and I were the guys. And that's how that's that, how that was it. Through. Sort of uh, uh, very uh, you know early beginnings, and, 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 but you've grown so much. Now, who back then were your kind of fellow – Safari operators, tour operators back then. Who were the founders of this of that business that you might have interact with or encountered back then? Or competed with. <laughs> or competed with too. Yeah. yeah I, I was a big competitor, I have to say. I think that everybody was fairly laid back until I arrived. You know. <laughs> so <laughs> there was Karen Downey, the most famous one. Okay. And the best, uh, one of the best hunters was John Sutton, who was very famous, a good friend of mine. Um, there was Hunters Africa, another big hunting company. Um, and then there were um, the, 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 the smaller company, like United Touring Company, was there. Right. Um, another another photo phototype safari company started called Flamingo Tours. Okay, run actually by a good friend called Clive Fru, and his son, by the way, is the Tour de France winner, Chris Fru, who oh, lives okay. in Monaco. I think he, we're only <laughs> one square mile, so if I go like this, he's somewhere in that radius, right? <laughs> so, oh wow! So. Um, yeah, another one with Thorn Tree Safaris, but we're all we're all quite old. Lim, Limblad was there, Limblad too. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah by uh, Sven Sven Olaf's father, Sven Lim. Yeah, his uh, last Eric Limblad, and so that was it. Not not very many of us, right? And we all scurried around and tried to steal each other's clients. All right. Yeah. Now, what what back then was considered to be luxury travel or exotic travel, such as you, what you were offering? Obviously, people thought you know high end resorts and and super cruise lines, but you, you offered a, a experiential travel really early, and also probably sustainable travel very early. What what was luxury back then? What were luxury travel customers looking for? Well, this is the problem. I told you everybody came to hunt, 
And when they hunted, they had the luxury camps and they could shoot their food every night, all right? You could shoot guinea fowl, you could shoot uh, Thompson's gazelle, you could shoot, you know, uh, Elan, uh, you could shoot buffalo, and you ate and you ate your way to Africa, all right? Perfect. Talking with the photographic safari, there's nowhere to stay. There were no lodges. It was just self-service camp. Right. There's only one lodge in, in the Maasai Mara called Kick Rock Lodge. Very few lodges. And they were quite rustic. Right. And so that's why I had to devise it. Why can't I form a hunting safari type living? Right. And then I'll bring in ice machines so that I can stock it with fresh food so we don't have to shoot. So that was, that, you know, like, that was my big idea. Right. That, that nobody thought of it. Nobody had done it. Think of all the tender camps there are today. I yeah. saw the very, I started the very first one. There wasn't one before I started, and so apart from the hunting one, and so this has led the whole train of where we are today. And, and the fact I knew that we had to have great activity during the day, and at night we needed absolutely the most comfortable living, five yeah. star dinners, incredible views. Beside, beside the Mara River with hippo at the top of mountain cliffs <clears throat> in Rwanda, exploding with volcanoes behind you in, in Congo. So <clears throat> I, I, I really worked really hard with it. Serengeti, you could camp anywhere. I was the first to camp, can you believe, in the bottom of the Ngorongoro crater when there was nobody. I well, just I drove my truck down. A lot of first, but it, it sounds like to me back then luxury was ice cream on safari. I don't know. <laughs> but it was. I mean, luxury, luxury was, was a cold drink, right? Right. A really cold beer after a long day. And then you'd have toast and butter and you'd have real steaks and you'd have everything on safari. It was all that was it. And so I created the first high activity experiential travel without kind of knowing it, you know? No, that's great. Now, now, obviously, over the years, you went far beyond just safaris. How did Abercrombie & Kent evolve over the years, and what were the sort of stages of its evolution as you added new products and destinations? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm a Kenyan, so we grew up in Kenya. Then I obviously expanded immediately because we were part of East Africa. That was Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. Then I said, hmm, I should expand this. And so I looked up because I knew a lot of animals. So, so we moved into then Rhodesia. Uh, down below. And then I moved, I drove to, to Botswana in 1967 when I think it was Bechuana land. Um, drove my truck all the way down there. And from there went into, into South Africa. Then in about 1972, about seven, in 70, 72, sorry, right. 72, I opened my own office in London. Okay. So I started to sell my own products. So I stopped being a B2B, I went to B2C. So I, I have my own office in London, 72, and in the United States two or three years later in Oak Brook, Illinois. And um, that was a big take-up because now I'm selling my own product and I knew what, what to sell. And for instance, I was in New York one day and I talked to somebody and um, talked about a safari. So I said to him, so what's the most dangerous thing you do every day? Mm -hmm. Oh, I said, the most dangerous thing I do every day? Oh, it's running an amber light on the way to work. Oh, great. <laughs> So that's what I have to be. <laughs> that's my dog. So a, low, I said, oh, a low threshold, right? <laughs> these, yeah, these Americans not very well. They're not very exciting. <laughs> uh, not, I swim with crocodiles in Lake Baringo, and he's worried about a, running an amber light and the way to work. We run red lights all the time. Okay, so I thought, you know, there's got to be something here. I'll become the danger guy. Right. So I mean, and then I came up with this: like, I'll do it myself. Take pictures of me doing myself. Take all the danger out of it and sell it. That's me. Right. So that's what we did. And so I then got the big British Airways contract. In, right. in, my good friends in, in London decided to trust this young, young guy with the British Airways holidays. Right. And I took that over in 1978. I guess right. I took it in 78. So we signed the contract in 76, 78. That launched me immediately, British Airways. I immediately went to Egypt, right. India, all over Africa. So suddenly that, that came into my, and so I started to do that. And I took fan trips, took 1,000 travel agents a year on educational trips. Amazing. With a wonderful guy called David Schaefer. Where did that come from? They're no longer with us, sadly. But David was the instructor. So I wanted to instruct people on how to sell really dangerous experiential travel. It wasn't really dangerous. I take a lot of danger out of it, but it seemed that way. And so that's 
that's how it all started. And from then, I went to China. Right. In China, in about '76, and well, I went there for I went there for like a, a 130 days. I mean, it was a long time, over three months. Right. And they were and they were so impressed. They were so impressed by this. They said, "We want to reward you. You know, we we should send you out on holiday. How can we reward you?" I said, "You can give me the exclusive license to bring individuals." To China, right? We said, and they said, sure, okay. So then we opened our Hong Kong office with dear Patrick McLeod, and we started going into China. And then from then on, I just, you know, I really, I really persevered around the world. I went everywhere where you shouldn't go. I was the first to go up the Amazon from the source all the way up to the north of the old explorer ship. We took over the explorer ship in about I can't remember when in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. But Antarctica and that to the south, north of oh, yeah. that was a big thing for you now, going to Antarctica, yeah. Yeah, we, did, we were the first, you know, after Limblad, we were the first, well, we were second there. Eh? Um, and so we really pioneered all the countries you read about today. You see all these ships, more and more ships. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, I loved it when I was pioneering this. It was just me. And all I had to do was convince everybody that I wasn't nuts and that <laughs> they should all go there. Now everybody yeah. goes there. And then, well, so, that is true. Yes. That, that market, that market has exploded, and uh, you're still, yeah. Obviously, you have a lot more competition now. Let, let's talk a little bit about how you think the luxury travel market has changed since those those years. What What do you think has changed uh, for the market overall? Because obviously, a lot of people have come into the market with a lot of different experiences. You, you've got a lot more competition. You're still there. You're still doing what you do best. But uh, what do you think has changed about luxury? Well, first of all, it has become a coin phrase. You know, it is not luxury often. It connotates sort of silk thread sheets and champagne on ice and a bowl of caviar, right? right. Maybe that was a luxury in those days, right? right. Um, I created experiential travel, and I called it off the beaten track. Right. I wish I was saying that was my term, for it, off the beaten track. And that's what I did, all of my activity. But in those days, the people who take that were usually – Two couples who knew each other, usually in their 50s or 60s, usually in their 60s, retired, two couples. And um, as, as it evolved, they became more adventurous. We were the first to do Kilimanjaro timing safaris, first to do gorilla trekking safaris, all of all off the beaten track. Uh, right. so good. <clears throat> people got younger. And they're, well, I can do that because older people couldn't do that. Sure. So I drove, the product drove us into a younger bracket, and they lost to love it. And then in the last 20 years, 30 years, it has been families. The family said, you know, I, I'll bring my son. He's only 14, 15 years old. Can he climb Kilimanjaro? I said, you know, I sold a trip yesterday to a Russian, to the South Pole. He said, my, my son is eight. I got one son of 16 and the other age nine. Can the nine-year-old go? I said, sure. <clears throat> he can't do everything, but he can, he can come with you. So suddenly, family said, I want to do this with my family. Right. So then you get the multi-generational effect. Suddenly, grandfather says, listen, I got all the cash. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, probably going to die quite soon. Why don't I take the whole family and we'll all have a wonderful multi-generational experiential trip. And the grandfather, by the way, can climb up to the top of Kilimanjaro as well because they're super fit these days. That's yeah. the other thing. They're super fit. The 70-year-olds go, I mean, look, I went to the South Pole at age 77, right. <clears throat> 76. To the South Pole, and that's a very strange, difficult trip. Um, more people have climbed Everest than have been to the South Pole. To give you some idea of how difficult it is. No, it's so, absolutely true. Yeah, no, it is. People are much more hardier and willing to go places now. In terms of the luxury customer, you mentioned, yeah, it's more families, more anything. But in terms of what they're looking for, and you mentioned it exactly. It's shifted from those caviar days and, and the, the traditional things of what makes for luxury into more experiential, and that's what you specialized in. So, obviously, you were in the right place, right? Well, again, if I can have the opportunity while I'm sitting, if I can uh, blow our own horn just for a second, I promise. But, but experiential trips means it's an experience. You have got to own the companies on the ground. Right. There's no Abercrombie and Kent. You know, we own 67 odd companies throughout the world, covering 135 countries. Right? right. We own the guide. We train the guide. Everything is in the guide because it's the last minute. The last minute is there a problem. Is there a 
it's a crocodile, it's a, it's a snake, it's a, what is it? It's something. And you need, and so it's far easier to put people on luxury cruise ships and say, this is a great adventure, but it actually is right. it's not a great adventure. What we do a great adventure is because you've got to own the guide. The guides have to work for you. They can't be subcontracted. And so I think that's why Abercrombie and Kent has grown in such a miraculous fact, maybe not miraculous, but we've had a huge growth for the last 10 years, just explosive. And that's why I open up more and more DMCs because I cannot subcontract. You've got to own the guy. The guy has to take care of the last mile. Well, you have more control. You clearly have more control about the experience throughout. So that is one of the marks of your company. Absolutely. I agree. And one of the things is food. You, you talk about food. Many people, it's funny, people got much, much more um, ambitious and, and fit and athletic, but they become very, um, very what's the word? specific about their food. Right. So they're either a vegan or they're vegetarian or they can't eat beef, but they can't eat that, and they can't eat this, but they can't do that. And so they have almond milk, but they can't have real milk. But again, because you own the company, <coughs> we can do all of that. Right. Abercrombie can covers the last mile from the breakfast table, dinner table, um, uh, you jump in a car, jump out of a car, get in a, get in a balloon, uh, go in a helicopter. We own that space, the last mile. And that's what makes all the difference. No, absolutely. Now, let's shift over to travel advisors who are our viewers today. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of all, we do have some consumers. Uh, how should travel advisors approach the luxury travel customer today? What has changed with that customer that they should know about? You mentioned, obviously, there's more families doing luxury travel and experiential travel. But what do they have to know, uh, you know, from your perspective? Well, I think from my perspective, they shouldn't uh, – I, I, from the travel advisor's point of view, I would never underestimate the client. The client now, today, because of um, because of these things, right? Yeah. They know everything. They Google, right? Or they think they, they know everything. <laughs> they know everything. They come in and they'll tell you all about how to track a gorilla in the Congo or in the, in Uganda or in Rwanda. They know everything. I think I, Googled, everything. I think I Googled that yesterday, actually, how to track a gorilla in the Congo. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So you're sitting with a with a highly informed client. Right. Then you're sitting with a highly active, for the most part, client. So you have to find out from them, what do they really want to do? Do they actually, have they thought of tracking a gorilla? Have they thought of visiting the wildlife migration? Have they thought of taking a trek in Bhutan? I think travel advisors have to also think out of the box, all right? They're going to do what I've been doing the last 15 years, which is getting right out there, dive in Palau take a helicopter to base camp Everest, um, uh, go and see the northern lights in Finland. Don't bother with Iceland. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what Iceland is now. I went 20 years ago, nobody had been to Iceland. Right. Now everyone been to Iceland, so now I've got to go to Finland. You see. Um, you, you, Ethiopia, do it, do it by helicopter. So the, um, I'm going to take a, a trip to the Cocos Islands. Do you know where the Cocos Islands are? No, I do not. Okay, fine. It's off Costa Rica, but it's a three-day cruise in a, in a ship which is carrying a big submarine. We'll go in a cruise ship alongside and we'll dive and dive in a submarine for four days at the Cocos Islands, one of the most least explored amazing places in the world. Right. So you've got to get to these places now. Kilimanjaro is like everybody climbs to Kilimanjaro. So you have to get, you know, the Inca Trail. <clears throat> That's fabulous too. So <clears throat> I think you've got to really think out, think ahead of time and you know obviously i'm always free for any call anybody likes adventure i'd love to talk with them <clears throat> well you know in, fa in fact well, that was my next question you already you already talked about it is how you are developing luxury tour products today you're going out at the cutting edge and finding these places that people haven't go I mean, before we began the interview we we're talking about going off to the middle east and doing these special vehicles that go all over the place but you're finding new experiences all the time right that's how we started the interview. I, I remember saying, I'm going to find the most dangerous things to do, do it myself, and make it as safe as I can, and then right. sell it. And all these years later, we started in 62, what are we now? I don't know. 2021? <laughs> almost, what? Well, yeah, that's almost, well, that's a long time. <laughs> um, well, and that's what I'm doing. See, Same see, in the, in the, in the old, in, in, if you had done, started doing this today, you'd be making a TV show, I think, about this, and, 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 yeah, and we're, making everybody we're, off on your adventures. 
No, people do. I mean, we have a lot of, I'm, I'm now going through a lot of amazing TV offers. Yeah, absolutely. But it's a question of time. You know, I don't want to spend my whole time in front of a TV. I want to go and actually take, uh, yeah. take our travel advisor's clients on some unbelievable trips. And it changes their lives. I've always said that. One of my trips will change your life. And um, I always ask everybody too. The other thing is, um, um, when was the last time you did something for the first time? Right. Ask yourself, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And so I still want to do a lot of things. I've never been in an extreme electric off-road vehicle. Yeah, but by the end of this month, <clears throat> I don't know that. I'll tell you about it. It'll be fantastic. Well, some um, of them didn't exist. Extreme electric vehicles were probably pretty fun, uh, too, right? <laughs> yeah, we're joining Lewis Hamilton um, yeah. and all the others. Um, it's going to be oh, really, wow. yeah, it's going to be really fun. Absolutely. I'll tell you all about it. Next, next interview. We can look. Next interview. And I'm very curious about your, your, your time with Lewis Hamilton because I, 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 my dream has always been to dr drive a Formula One dr race a against Lewis Hamilton. would be not bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be perfect. <laughs> And in fact, I know you know Jackie Stewart too, so that would have been a lot. Oh, of I love Jackie. Yeah, he's such a such a wonderful man. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about the past year. Obviously, it's been pretty horrible. It sounds like you've you've uh, been you know racking up the experiences no matter what. But uh, how has the pandemic affected the luxury travel market, and has it changed? Uh, and if so, is that change permanent? Well, I mean, I think we entered this whole thing. You know, we and I said, you know, you've got to check every. Every day of the time, every week of the time. It's so easy to say, oh, my God, pandemic reaction. We'll never be able to travel again. Oh, we don't have a job. What happens if we don't take the PCA? Uh, uh, and you just drove it, you drive yourself into the ground. You know, right. like, oh, let's give up. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not like that. I'm like, okay, it's a challenge. Let's find places where we can go. Let's yeah. find safe places. Saudi Arabia is incredibly safe, right? I mean, nobody goes to Saudi Arabia. I mean, they're like uh, the Red Sea, which I used to read books from Cousteau uh, on the diving, was all about the Red Sea. Right. It hasn't been touched. The, the Red Sea on the side of Saudi Arabia is crystal clear, beautiful. And so, you know, again, I'm pushing myself to do that. Let's have a new destination. And, you know, we're bringing on our own destination. I'm pushing a lot more private jet flying. Everybody loves taking private jets. Um, you know, I came back from Brazil, went to Brazil with the family in a private jet. So easy. It took 16 hours. Load the whole family on. 16 hours later, you land. There you are. Oh. So I think we can do more of this personalized villa, the villa business, you know, which I've, I've you know, really led that, led that side of things for many, many, many years, right? All the way back to our competitor was Corfu Villas years ago. You know, that's taken off. Everybody wants a villa today. So everybody wants a villa, want a private jet, they want to go to somewhere you can't go to, they want individual camps, they want to go to Botswana, they want everything that's more private. They don't want to go to city centers so much. Right. They don't right. want to go now, yes. under, they maybe don't want to go to the Louvre or the, or the British Museum or things like that. They, 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 you know, we'll do that later. We want to go, not too many people. And I would, by the way, they want totally individual trap, which is what my chairman's club is all about. We have all the individual tour councillors. We discuss it with the, with the tour to the travel advisors, give them information in, in case they don't have it, tell them what to do, who was there for them. So it's individual treatment, unusual places, secluded where possible. Um, and I just said, it, that's it. Now, another thing that's come up to large, and we kind of forgot about it for the past year, but I think as we emerge, it gets more important is sustainability. And obviously, you've had a long focus on sustainable travel, and it's grown more important over the years for the luxury traveler, especially. Uh, how, has the focus on sustainable tourism changed since you began your company? Well, there was no sustainable travel whatsoever <laughs> when we started. I mean, I, I first started sustainable travel in 1982 uh, when we formed Friends of Conservation um, in the Maasai Mara and then in, uh, uh, in, in Kenya. And um, the Prince of Wales became the patron of that in 78, uh, sorry, in 87. And um, we also launched Abercrombie Kent Philanthropy, round about then, headed up by Keith Sproul. And wherever Abercrombie Kent goes, you've got to have a parallel course of doing something in philanthropy. Otherwise, why would the local people like you? I mean, they have an idyllic life. And long you come, put up camps, trucks, uh, vehicles, planes. Why would you like it? You wouldn't like it. So <clears throat> it has to make, it has to, be sustainable for them. We've got to bring them money. It's got to be a business, cash flow. <clears throat> so we created all of that. And we work around, you know, health, conservation, the community. 
And I think we've done a phenomenal job wherever we've been. You know, we've built wells in Cambodia. Uh, we have uh, bicycle shops in Nakatindi. We have uh, health, uh, a lot of health places in the Maasai Mara. And so it goes on. But they're going to be run parallel and they're going to be independent of each other. Right. And I think, and to answer your question, people have not cared that much. I'm very surprised. Mm-hmm. They have not cared until recently. Yeah, well, I, I, I did think, you know, that, that luxury has uh, starting as we emerge, especially now, that it's going to be more equated to sustainability and uh, people caring about that stuff and even introducing experiences that, uh, you know, for these travelers so they can experience uh, destinations with the locals and really get with the people and even help out, right? Well, the last 10 years, you've seen a big change. And I think this COVID has been a huge shock to everybody, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. And everybody's asking me today about sustainable. How sustainable are you? What are you doing? And, you know, it's going to be, we're going to make our, you know, we're already a pretty greener than green for most companies are, definitely. But we want to sell, make ourselves more than that. And Obama will show the, show the how, we, how we have actually converted the local peoples with education. Look, look what we did at Wendy. I mean, that was a, a fig tree um, where, where I had one doctor once a week, who we came to take care of the people in Uganda. Right. Today, that's a, that's a hospital, 60,000 wow. outpatients, nurses' wards, you know, maternity wards, teachers. I mean, we, we've changed the whole city of Windy, or town of Windy. There was no town when we arrived. So gorillas and the money that we have, that we have made from gorillas has created this huge income for the people who live there. And by right. the way, that idea has saved 430 mountain gorillas which is 50% of the world's population. So you can say a simple idea that I had has had all that effect. It saved the local population. It's built hospitals. It saved the gorilla population. It's win, win, win. There's, there's no losing. No, that's a great example. And it's a very laudable very, for your company to have, have been really the, the beginning of it all. Now, let's talk a little bit about what's to come. And, and obviously, you're out there trying to figure out what's to come for luxury and upscale travel. What will be the next best thing? What, or are we going back to the future with luxury tour products? What do you, what do you think? Well, I think that if, that if I'd formed Abercrombie in 1962, I must have had COVID in mind exactly. Because... <laughs> Our company is exactly built for this situation. Right. Private, tailor-made, highly focused, individual travel to secluded places by sea, by air, by camp, by villa. And so I think we're all set. And people are going to choose (coughs) individually where they want to go. Right. And and they're going to move in very small groups to begin with. And I think our expedition cruising will definitely take off. Smaller boats. No more than 150 on a boat. People will like them. It maybe I don't know yet, but maybe the big boats is you know, maybe more tricky. I don't know, but certainly the small expedition ships will do really well. Right. And I think villas will do really well. I think private jet trips, like we you know we pioneered private jet. Yeah, you, 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 you host them. private jet is the only way to go. I mean, yeah. you know, if you have the money, this is perfect. You know. No, that, so yeah, I think we're well situated for that. That's great. Now. Final question, uh, what would you like, else would you like to tell our uh, luxury selling travel advisors and luxury buying travel consumers about the market today and what it will be in the future? Well, I think, first of all, this has been a long haul, all right, for all of us. I mean, very difficult. The good news is that all of our luxury clients have been saving money because they haven't been able to spend it. That's true. And what, do, and what do they want to do? They want to travel. And so we've taught them well. They say they got money and they want to travel. And as long as all the tour travel advisors make sure that all their clients know that they're there and willing to help them, that's all we have to do. I think you're going to see an absolute explosion of travel um, in the fourth quarter of this year. You know, there'll be some in the summer. It's, it's already starting up. Yeah. I mean, I sold a South Pole trip, 10 people, $250,000 a person. So that's $500,000 for two, for 10 days. We sold it out in three weeks wow. in December 22. Sold out. So everyone wants to travel, but they're saying, ah, oh, we can do that. We take a private plane from Cape Town. We go to the South Pole with nobody there. We can do that. That's COVID-free. That's pretty good. So you've got to think of places that are pretty much as free of COVID as, as we can make. Now, we're all going to have jabs. 
But even if we have jabs, I'm told <clears throat> that you can still carry the virus. So you've all got to probably have TPR tests whenever we travel, sure. um, probably. They've got to come up with a formula that does urgent CPR tests, have it in minutes rather than hours. <clears throat> That's very important. And um, But everybody wants to travel. You've just got to make it easier. And the government have to make it easier for us. That's, that's the problem. Each, each government has a different uh, opinion of what should be happening. And if only somehow they could communicate, have, have, a, have a one voice to everybody, it would be really, really much better. Well, I know that's a lot what we all hope for. And in fact, I, I think I'll be down at the World Travel and Tourism Council meeting uh, in, in, in uh, April trying to figure that one out uh, with everybody else. So uh, anyway, listen, Jeffrey, thank you once again uh, for uh, talking with us. Uh, I think you've delivered some wonderful messages uh, to luxury selling agents. Uh, it's the arc of your career is simply amazing. And the fact that you're still out there uh, experiencing and trying to find that best new experience is, is uh, you're my hero. I got to tell you, because it's just amazing uh, uh, what you go and find for, for the rest of us in terms of luxury experiences that everybody wants. So again, thank you so much. And it's been great to see you again. And by the way, I'll see you in Cancun. I'll be there. Excellent. So we'll, if I, when, this, when this airs, we'll have already been there, and uh, so we'll hopefully raise a glass to everybody. Great. So we'll, toast each, we'll toast each other in Cancun, all right? Absolutely. Take care, Jeffrey. We'll see you soon. 